The sun is not the center of the solar system. What are you talking about? I, mean, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, we used to think the Earth was, uh, but but okay, let's go ahead and see where this takes us, guys. I just say suggestion via Discord. Let's find out why. Uh, let's jump into it. Hey, smart people, Joe hey. here. If someone walked up to you today and said, hey, the sun isn't the center of the solar system, you would think that person is weird. Like if they sat down next to you, probably yeah. get up and move. Probably. Because the sun being the center of the solar system, the earth orbiting the sun, that's like elementary school stuff. Well, today I am that weird person. The sun isn't the center of the solar system and it won't be until 2027. Before you turn off this video thinking I've completely lost my mind, I need to explain two things. Yeah, One, I am right and you'll see why. Two, when we look at the Oh no. Two things. Hold on, One, guys. I am right and you'll see why. Okay, so here's the thing, bro. He's definitely playing word semantics here. I'm just going to be honest here. These are this is what I would honestly directly call word semantics. All right. Um, but let's continue. Two, when we look at the crazy history of people figuring out what is actually in the center of the solar system, well, there's a really important lesson about where new ideas come from in science and what it takes for a new idea to actually become the truth. <laughs> a lot. It's a lot. Oh, hey, I want to take a quick second to say thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. We literally couldn't do this without you. You helped make this video possible. There's no sponsor on this video. We thank you. Link down in the description if you'd like to join that community. Let's go. I'm not sure if I've ever actually said this out loud in a video before, but one of the fundamental principles that I believe in as a science communicator is that you never fully understand an idea until you understand where it comes from. So let's get into it. Pretend it. you're a big shot astronomer in 1400s Europe. This uh, is what the universe looks like as far as you know. Earth at the center. Hold on, hold on, wait, wait. Uh, this is the, uh, the theory of, um, oh God, guys. Uh, geocentrism. And everything revolving around us. Now, if that were true, if we actually lived in that geocentric universe, what would you see? With like specifically the, uh, the Talmudic, uh, oh God, the, the Talmudic model of the universe. Uh, geocentrism, uh, Claudius uh, Ptolemy. When you step outside to look at the sky, you would see pretty much exactly what you do see. The sun, the moon, the stars moving across the sky and the earth under your feet steady and not moving. Today we understand that the stars and planets moving across the sky is a kind of apparent motion created by a moving earth careening through space. But here's a hot take you can debate in the comments. If we did actually live in a geocentric universe, okay. you probably wouldn't even notice. It's very difficult to forget everything we know today about how the universe works. But back in a time when our only tools for looking at the sky were the two eyes on the front of our face, this makes a whole lot more sense than this. So why did it take thousands of years to realize that was wrong? Well, blame this guy. Aristotle was an ancient Greek philosopher in the mid 300s BC, and here's the universe according to him. I definitely wouldn't also say thousands of years. I think we figured it out uh, uh, via Copernicus in the 1500s, guys. Um, so I would probably more say a thousand and a half years, guys. But either way, let's... Uh, Earth, round, not flat, because Aristotle had seen ships coming over the horizon and Earth's round shadow on the moon, and the ancients weren't dumb, okay? Right. There's seven bright sky thingies. The moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And since they wander across the sky, they're called the wanderers, wanderers or planetes. Moving on invisible spheres around Earth like a Russian doll with the stars out here like a sparkly candy shell. We don't feel the Earth move. So in Aristotle's universe, the Earth didn't move, like at all. Only the heavens moved in unchanging, perfect circles. And that part will be important in a minute. Now, to them, this represented the entire universe. There was no such thing as galaxies or the Big Bang. This was it. And it was the basis for most of the world's astronomy for the next 2,000 years or so. But it didn't take long for people to notice Aristotle's model didn't match up with what was actually happening in the sky. Because ancient people were not stupid, they were really good at observing and calculating things. They weren't distracted on social media all the time, like all those kids today. 
and me. Now, astronomers had noticed that planets like Mars sometimes seem to stop, move backwards in the sky, or in retrograde motion, and then forwards again. Aristotle's model couldn't explain this. A new model was needed. Problem is, Aristotle was a BFD, a big, f famous yeah, dude. Deal. We're talking like the original influencer. You can right. just throw his idea away. We're talking about Aristotle, man. What if we just tweak the idea instead? You know, make a few teensy changes. Well, that's what Claudius Ptolemy did. Claudius Ptolemy, yep. Um, yeah, they, he has to be mentioned in, thing, in things like this, even though his uh, overall model of geocentrism was, was definitely wrong. Like he's the, uh, the basic template for uh, modern science, uh, astrology, geography, guys. He, he's the creator of longitude and latitude. This was the man here, guys. Um, I mean, I get it. There are some people who absolutely are fascinated and fixated uh, with, with, just like you said here, the influencer nature of Aristotle. Uh, but Claudius Ptolemy was the man, bro. It was, it's him. Like, he combined like Roman and Greek, like, like maps into one and then basically created like what we know as kind of like a map of the world, guys. See, this is the man here. All right. So I'll be honest here. I like, I like Ptolemy much better than Aristotle, but um, that's an argument for a different day. Bold move with the silent P but he was a bold guy. So we're in the second century AD now, Alexandria, Egypt, crossroads of all the world's great ideas about nature and the universe. To explain retrograde motion, Ptolemy said, as they orbit the earth, the planets are spinning on their own circles called epicycles. Yeah, epicycles. What are the planets spinning around? Doesn't matter, don't think about that, okay? People had <laughs> also figured out that the time between the spring and fall equinox was about a week longer than from the fall to spring equinox. I've only there were a simple and elegant way to explain that. Hmm, nope. Ptolemy said, let's just nudge Earth a little bit so it's not totally in the center and everything rotates around this invisible magic point instead. Now, Earth is still mostly in the middle, unmoving, because that's how Aristotle said it should be, but all this circles on circles business is really getting quite strange. Now, Ptolemy's math was actually pretty impressive. In terms of calculating the positions of planets, this was an accurate enough model. It was just super wrong. In fact, when it comes to complex, elegant theories based on totally wrong assumptions, this might take the cake. Yeah, Ptolemy's the astronomy ever. book ended up being one of the most important science texts in history, and it basically defined how people in Europe and the Islamic world interpreted the sky for the next thousand years. We well, said the really interesting guys really quickly. Um, like I don't mind speaking of like Ptolemy, Aristotle, Copernicus, etc. All the greats here, right? All the all the all the champions of of the sky, let's say, right? But bro, ancient Kemet and like so, like the Sumerian tablets already understood this way before this. For some reason, they just took their knowledge as. Um, like irrelevant knowledge for some reason. I, who knows, guys? But they just did not accept any of what they were saying. But funny enough is that they had the right answer many, many thousands of years ago, guys. They they had yeah, ancient Sumerian tablets already understood that, that the center of the universe, our, our, our solar system, um, let's say, was, in fact, the sun. We've already understood that, guys. All right? But you can go ahead and spend the next thousand years trying to figure that out. Do your thing, bro. All right, but either way. That's partly because there were some pretty powerful people out there with a strong interest in calculating astronomical events. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Vatican. Church. Now today, Christian holidays like Easter happen whenever your kittens as K-pop bands calendars says that they do. But in the Middle Ages, the church had to literally tell everyone when Easter was supposed to happen. Quick sidebar, let's talk about Easter. The church had declared that Easter would fall on the Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And back in the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, the church had declared that the spring equinox was always on March 21st. Problem was, they were using a Roman calendar where the year was 11 minutes too long. So after like a thousand years of that, the actual equinox, like the astronomical event, was happening way earlier than the church said it should. Plus, the Bible <laughs> claimed that the earth didn't move, just like Aristotle said. And whether you're a peasant or a planet, you didn't question the church. Luckily, the church employed some of the world's best astronomers and mathematicians, like this guy from Poland, Mikolaj Kopernik, better known by his Latin name, Copernicus. 
Around 1500, Copernicus was studying the cutting-edge astronomy of his time, so he was likely exposed to the works of Islamic, Persian, and Indian astronomers right. who were making more and more precise measurements of the sky. And they had noticed that Ptolemy's geocentric model of the universe it wasn't matching the math. Right. Over the next few decades, Copernicus calculated and recalculated and re-recalculated the heavens, and the result was a new heliocentric cosmology with the Helio sun, guys. sun at the center, the Earth moving around it, rotating yeah. on its axis, and all the other planets doing the same. But contrary to what you might have heard, the church was totally on board with Copernicus, at least for a while. And heliocentrism hit the bestseller list in 1543 with this book. The bestseller list? Latin name that I'm not going to attempt out loud. Nobody is quite sure who the first person was to place the sun at the center of the solar system. I mean, there are writings as far back as the third century BC. A guy named Aristarchus had the earth going around the sun, spinning on its axis. But none of those early attempts to challenge Aristotle's universe caught on until Copernicus could have been his position in the church. You think so? I, mean, I think it was a little bit more than that. Maybe history just aligned and the world was ready. Whatever it was, Copernicus's idea changed <laughs> the universe, Guys. literally. What's notable about these early models is they really ignore why any of this is happening, right? I mean, right. all these models. That's also factual. Um, yeah, the earlier models like that, that already explained these things with these things, they just didn't explain it. Right? They just said it is because it is, right? Um, and I think um, like these other these other individuals, they were like, "Listen, no, we have to explain why it is the way it is." While the Sumerian tablets are just like, "Nah, bro, this is it. That's it. Well, why are we arguing? We already understand this." Uh, or maybe they did it. Maybe they had a better understanding uh, of the solar system than um, you know we did. Potentially, who knows, guys? But uh, they got it right the first time. And they didn't even explain it because it seemed like maybe it was just already common knowledge. Uh, this is kind of why I believe, potentially, uh, that if aliens were to actually come and visit us, they are not something foreign to us. They're probably us, uh, but they're probably from a very long time ago. Right? Uh, that's kind of my opinion. That's right. I think that there are no aliens like that, in, in that perspective at least. I think they're probably us. Or things that... Uh, things that evolved on Earth many, 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 many years ago. Uh, because if the knowledge is already there on the Sumerian tablets, bro, why are we even arguing about what's going on? Just a thought. Ancient Kemet knew all of this stuff. Models, even Copernicus's really, their point was giving people a way to calculate the positions of things in the sky. They probably weren't really meant to show the universe as it actually is. But after Copernicus, that was about to change. Now that we had the sun and earth where they should be, a guy named Kepler came along and figured out that the reason planets sometimes move faster and slower through the sky is because orbits are ellipses. Guys, let me know in the comments which is your favorite Kepler planet. Let me know. I have a couple. I have a lot of them. I, love, I have a lot of them. I like them all, almost. I would never want to actually live on one of them. But let me know which one of your, is, your, is your favorite. Not perfect circles. An Italian fella named Galileo started playing with these and noticed other planets have their own moons. And Venus has phases just like our moon does. That only works if everything's orbiting the sun. And this guy, Newton, maybe you've heard of him? He said these things aren't held in place by magical crystal spheres. It's something called gravity. After almost 2,000 years being stuck on Aristotle, by 1700, the universe had been totally redefined a few times. And this brings us to why heliocentrism isn't totally accurate. Because if you keep going down Newton's road, you realize that any two things with mass exert gravity on each other. The apple pulls on the earth a minuscule amount, just like the earth pulls on the apple. This means the earth and the moon are actually both orbiting a point in between the two of them. Jupiter and the sun are orbiting a point way out here. And when you factor in the mass and position and pull of everything in the solar system, well played, bro. the well gravitational played. center of the solar system actually looks like this, a point moving through space. Right now, at this moment, the center of everything is outside the sun, and it won't be inside the sun again until 2027. You know what they say. You are technically correct. 
The best kind of correct. So, why do we it. care? Word semantics. Does this affect your day-to-day -day life? No. Honestly, probably not. No. But the biggest thing that science gives us isn't an ability to see things how they are. It's the ability to make predictions and figure out what will happen in the future. And to Accurate make predictions. really precise predictions, like putting space telescopes in orbit or shooting probes to Saturn or whatever. This is a better truth than this. We haven't had our last scientific revolution. We've continued gazing deeper into the heavens with greater and greater precision. And today, we know that our solar system orbits the center of everything in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way and the rest of our local group of galaxies orbit a bare center in the Virgo supercluster. And that supercluster is tugged on by everything in a bigger supercluster. All of these are bigger, more precise, more accurate truths. Perhaps they're just waiting for us to build something that will make them revolutionary too. Stay curious. As I like this, yes. Like you know, how much I love science. I love science. I love math. I love history. Right? I'm absolutely a nerd, guys. I am fully that. Uh, if you wanted to know what one, ah, uh, what one is, it's me. I'm. That's pretty much me. I love the concept of learning new things. I'm not sure I specifically learned anything brand new in this video here because, again, this is, um, I would say, probably late high school, early college level thing, right? Um, but it's solid. Listen, if if they want to make videos educating people on the solar system, I'm down for watching them and encountering them and, and checking them out here. Uh, and I'm definitely glad that um, Ptolemy was mentioned. He is absolutely my favorite. I would not say Copernicus. Um is uh, or Aristotle is, guys, but um, Copernicus is absolutely genius, no doubt here, guys. Respect where it's it's needed, um, but I think Ptolemy set up the building blocks, guys. That's kind of where I'm at, and I, and I would prefer to uh, uh, to look at the origin point. Yes, he was wrong about geocentrism, guys. He was in fact wrong, but without his overall insight, where would it be? Where would we be? Think about that for a second. It, it's him. It's just him, guys. But either way, like Aristotle wouldn't be Aristotle without Ptolemy. Copernicus would not be Copernicus without Ptolemy. Right, guys? But either way, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly. The fact that you just made it to the end of the video says a whole lot, actually. Uh, we have a couple other channels. Uh, Mr. Al Boyd Music. Mr. L. Boyd movie reacts, along with Mr. L. Boyd discusses, where I just generally speak about the things that specifically matter to me. But in the meantime, I'll catch you guys later.